So now that we've looked at a couple of memory corruption and vulnerabilities and exploits, right? Like we've overflown buffers, we've jumped to local functions, we've injected shellcode. It's a good time to talk about some of the um, protections for memory corruption before we look at a few more issues. So um, we're gonna look at bounds checking, non-executable stacks, canary values, and ASLR or address space layout randomization. So bounds checking is probably the, the first, the primary and the best solution to memory corruption. Right, these vulnerabilities happen because languages like C allow for writing past the boundary of an array or reading past the boundary of an array to access memory elements that weren't part of that buffer. Right. Typically this happens with functions that just don't do bounds checking, stuff like stir copy and get string and a number of others uh, will allow you to read, read or write past the bounds of an array. The basic solution here uh, is to just use safer versions of these functions. While these are not perfect, they're still potentially prone to misuse and therefore the introduction of vulnerabilities, there is kind of a safe way to use them. For example, for example, something like stir copy, which copies a source buffer into a destination buffer, can be replaced with stir n copy, where the function call takes a third parameter indicating the number of elements that you want to copy from the first array into the second or the first buffer into the second. So as long as that third parameter is equal to the size of the destination buffer, right? You're basically going to say, you know, if my destination string is 10 bytes, then this third parameter would be 10, and then it would never copy more than 10 bytes from source to destination. I mean, or ideally, you would actually make it like size of destination buffer minus one, uh, because we need to include the null terminator in there, right? So that's the idea. We just need to include some form of bounds checking, either through safe functions. Um, there are other entire C libraries as well that sort of patch the, the bad versions or introduce safer functions for string handling so that we don't have to deal with these issues in the first place. The reason we still see a lot of memory corruption vulnerabilities is that you know, these functions have existed for a long time. They're in a lot of um, training material and teaching material. They're in a lot of code bases. Um, honestly, some people just forget and use get s because it's a really easy function to remember how to use, but it is insecure. Now, what happens though, if you are not the developer, right? You've only got access to the compiled binary um, that may have a, a memory corruption vulnerability in it. What sorts of protections are available to you? Well, we can start with one that's sort of built in, if we want to call it at the CPU level, we kind of can't. Um, we have the concept of non-executable stack and potentially a heap as well, where regions of memory can be defined to have a certain set of permissions. So, you know, I might set the permissions on my text segment to be uh, read and execute, meaning I could read code from the text segment and I could execute code out of the text segment, but I wouldn't assign the right permission to it. Right. Um, there are ways to implement this uh, via different bits in hardware uh, on the popular CPUs, as well as within C using the mprotect function. So the goal here, for example, is to map the stack um, and change the permissions of the stack so that it, we've only got read and write, but no execute permissions in the stack. This would mean that our shellcode injection example from earlier wouldn't work because once code is injected into the stack, we wouldn't be able to run it or execute it out of the stack because of this memory protection. You could think of it as uh, like a flag that says, hey, is the instruction pointer ever pointing into a memory uh, address inside the stack? If so, crash or don't run, like call an illegal instruction or something like that. And that's the idea. Uh, we've been disabling this protection in our make file using dash z exec stack as one of our compile switches. Another concept we could use is to insert what we call a canary value, right? This makes reference to, you know, miners putting canaries in coal mines that would alert them to um, either gas leaks or running out of oxygen and things like that. So what will happen is a known value would be inserted into the stack between the return address and the previous um, frames um, stack uh, stack frame bottom, so BP. And when we return from a function, we check that canary value that sits on top of the return address. And if it's been modified or changed, we know that um, stack corruption has occurred and we would crash the program at that point. Uh, a lot of software implements this by default. It's uh, You'll know it's there, for example, in Ubuntu, if you overflow a C program you've written because you'll actually get a message on the uh, terminal that says like stack smashing attempt detected or something like that. The challenge here is making sure that the canary can't be predicted. Right? So um, 
Obviously, it needs to be randomly generated, but if we randomly generated a canary value and inserted it into a stack frame every single time we called a function for every process, it might be a little bit time consuming. It might draw too many system resources. So typically what happens is when we start a new process, a canary value would be generated for that entire process at that point, and that same canary value will be used for all function calls through the lifetime of that process. It's a, it's a bit of a compromise, right? I mean, since it's not a random value every single time, and it's always the same canary value in a process, if we can determine the canary for a process, we'll, we'll know what it will be for every subsequent function call as long as that process continues to run. Right? So if there's an earlier vulnerability in the program that allows us to read the canary value, then we could possibly uh, reuse it and inject it into the stack in a known location. Okay, so it's a little bit tricky, um, but it's a, it's a compromise in terms of performance and security. Lastly, the sort of third system level protection against this stuff is ASLR or address space layout randomization. What uh, ASLR does is every time our process starts, it changes where um, the heap, the stack, and the um, mapped third party libraries are in the process's virtual address space. It sort of offsets them um, by a number, by a random number of bytes every time. This would prevent code from having hard-coded memory addresses that they could jump to. For example, it, when we were writing our own shellcode, we had to jump to the first byte of the shellcode or somewhere in the stack where we had that knob slide. However, if that address changes drastically every time, we can't hard-code a memory address anymore. Um, and we might never land on the right spot in our code and we wouldn't be able to execute our program. Uh, we also wouldn't be able to jump to local functions because they're going to be remapped to different addresses every time as well. And so that's the goal of ASLR. Uh, again, it's effective, but there are bypasses to it. Um, for example, in a 32-bit application, the virtual address space is relatively small, and ASLR can actually be brute forced. Um, in a 64-bit application, the uh, area that uh, you know ASLR has to work with is a lot bigger, um, so it can be a little more time-consuming, a little more difficult. Um, maybe we can take a look at that later. Um, here are some of the flags that we've been disabling or enabling that would uh, work with these protections. So for example, in the compile line, the fno stack protector um, line that we have added to our make file removes the canary value from the stack. So if you remove that, you shouldn't be able to um, basically overflow the buffer past the return address anymore. The zexec stack is what disables the uh, execution of code from the stack. And if you set kernel.randomize underscore VA underscore space to two, that will turn on ASLR. You can also go into the example program and replace gets with something more secure like fgets, which again takes um, that third parameter where we can define the size of buffer that we're going to read into from standard in. Okay. Uh, we are going to look at a couple simple bypasses though for some of these. Um, to show that really that the only real way to get past these issues is with uh, actually fixing the bounds checking at the code level. But these systems level protections, while they are somewhat effective, can be bypassed. For additional content on this topic, here's some references you can check out.